This is episode number 11 of the My Niche is Human podcast. Welcome back to another episode. Thank you for joining. Today we're going to be interviewing two of my friends from an improv theater that I discovered down here in St. Pete, Florida, Zach and Amadeus. This episode I'm enormously proud of. These two gentlemen have great courage as they perform weekly. Today we're going to talk about how they unpack the psychology and learning lessons that they've gotten through practicing improv and how you can learn those too. So stick around to the end because we've got a little surprise for you. If you're waiting for us to start, we've already started. Because something that I learned from Gary Vee was, again, psychology. You don't just say, go. Yes. Because mm. the reaction is, ah, fuck. Mm-hmm. Right? So we're just going gonna to keep talking. And before you know it, you're going to get your, your tetanus shot. The band-aid is going to come off and we're, we're off and running. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've always felt that way. Like when I tell people that I do improv, oftentimes they don't know what improv is. And they just think stand-up comedy. And so then it's, yeah. oh, tell me a joke, right? And it's that same thing, go. And, and the last thing you want to do when you tell people that you're funny is get put on the spot and be told to perform. Right? Make me a bike clown. Yeah, right. <laughs> Here we go. Get to it. Right. Or like you ha- you'll have people uh, message you and be like, yo, this is a really funny joke. Maybe you can add it to your next standup. It's like, dude, that. I don't do standup. Yeah. So yeah. What, what would you say is the darkest difference between standup and improv? Yeah, it's all made up on the spot. Yeah. That's that's it, right? And and it should be done with more than one person. Which uh, one? Improv, right? Okay. Uh stand up is is necessarily individualistic, right? In a way. Uh you you spend a lot of time working with people, I think, right? Um riffing off of those ideas, but ultimately it comes down to you. Right? Yeah. Improv is, is the exact opposite. Right? Do any comedians stand up there in improv? Uh, actually, yeah. Some of them who are, who are really adept at their craft, they might do like a set. I think it's called set without a net. And then they might like get a, just a host of random topics appearing on the screen and then they have to riff in front of an audience. So that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's intimidating. But also, um, you know, as a comedian, you're drilling the same stuff and you're like uh, carving and making this sculpture with these words and trying to like cast a spell on the audience. And in improv, there's there's none of that. It's, mm-hmm. You do something, it might be magical and phenomenal, or it might be really freaking weak, and then you just got to toss it into the ocean, whether it's beautiful or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That My favorite uh, sort of saying about improv uh, that I got from a mentor of mine is improv is just a bunch of people falling down the stairs. Mm. Just for, Everybody's just flailing and floundering, and then at the very end, somehow, the last step, everyone lands on their feet. Mm. Right. And that, that's, that's something you can't get in, in stand-up comedy, right? I think that's the fundamental difference is uh, stand-up, maybe there's the fear just like the butterflies you get when you're about to give like a public speech, mm-hmm. but there's no fear of like, wow, I hope it goes well tonight. I have no idea what's about to happen, you know? Um, and no control. Yeah. So it's there's, a form of surrender. There's right? no the tight five in improv. <laughs> in improv. You can try all you want. <laughs> yeah. Uh. i trying for almost a decade. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you two for coming over. I'm sitting with two of my friends, Zach Morris and Amadeus. Dameron. Dameron. Yeah. Thank you. We are good friends. I just, yeah. it's on his last name. I like you too, Stefan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Excellent. So nice. we're here to talk about improv, theater, comedy, some of the dark sides and the light sides and how psychology intertwines everything in between because our niche is human. Mm. Yes, indeed. So, um, this question is for each one of you individually. Okay. Uh, why and how did you get into improv? And do you remember the, the first moment it kind of occurred to you? Yeah. I think, I think you should take that one for a sec. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I've got a, such a long journey with improv, but it started uh, sort of serendipitously. I, um, I wanted to go to UF so badly. I, I just, I was like ready to be a Gator and, uh, <laughs> my test scores just didn't, di- didn't cut it, you know, I, uh, and so I applied to a couple other places and it ended up being USF because of their Quidditch team. Okay. Uh, so I did wow. Quidditch for all four years with USF too, but, um, it was the first week, the week of welcome at USF, which is, you know, just all the freshmen, you know, you have a week before classes start, you can just kind of figure out what all the clubs are and, and, uh, what's going on on campus. And I had, I had made a friend uh, during the during the week of welcome, and I, I saw 
that there was going to be an improv show. And I loved, I loved comedy. I, I would come home after school every day and watch, you know, like stand up and stuff like that. So I said, let's, let's fucking go do it, man. Let's go. And it was, it was the improv club on campus that had been created like the semester before. And there Perfect. were six people in it. And at the end they said, if you want to sign up, we have signups in the back. And I grabbed my friend's hand and I dragged him. I said, Ricky, we're going to, we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I've noticed with, with improv, especially people just know, they say to themselves like, oh, this is entirely for me. I've been improvising my whole life. So I, yeah, I signed up immediately. Uh, they had a meeting the next week in the black box theater, uh, communication building, third floor. And, um, yeah, I remember the very first time I knew it was for me. We were doing this like freeze and justify game, which in retrospect, the worst improv warm up ever. Don't all it does is teach incredibly bad habits. Yeah, it does. Uh, right. But, but yeah, we were doing freeze and justify and somebody was like down on their knees being a cactus and I froze the scene and I tagged them out and I, I sang the, we are the lollipop guild thing from wizard of Oz and everybody laughed. And I was like, I'd never experienced that feeling before. Uh, and from there on out, that was it. Let, let's zoom in and unpack that. What was that feeling? Yeah, it was. Um, so I, I have a sort of a pessimistic view of the world that that's hard to, hard to escape from. Uh, always kind of suffered from nihilism and, and especially existentialism. So, uh, I was painted a really emo sort of negative, uh, version of myself always, always. So for the first time I had, I had created something that people appreciated, uh, in the moment, right. I was, I was purely being myself. There was nothing else I could be because the decision happened so quickly. Mm. Uh, and I, I was accepted and appreciated for that. And, and it just, uh, everything kind of washed away, you know, uh, ultimately what, what improv does for me is it allows me to, to, to be myself unapologetically, you know, um, and without fail. That's the end of the episode. That's great. That's awesome. Thanks. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One. All right. Bye. <laughs> All right. So now is it? Yes. Sir. I tell my story. Yes. All right. So I had no intentions of being a gator, but I, I had actually taken an improv class at a, at a place called American Stage uh, locally, and I wasn't really feeling it. It just wasn't, it didn't seem to be for me. I kind of, but I did make one friend there. Her name is Mary, and uh, even though I just decided it wasn't for me, uh, she hit me up one night to say, hey, there's this improv freestyling thing that I am going to force you to come to. And I was like, no. I'm definitely not doing that. And then she's very loud. And uh, so she dragged me out of the house and told me to come there. And who was leading it but old Zachary here? (laughs) Yeah, the cypher. (laughs) The cypher. Uh, And in that, we played a bunch of silly improv games. And it was a fairly large community of a bunch of misfits and and odd jobs who were all, weren't weren't flashy. Uh, They weren't trying to be successful. They were just being themselves through and through. And it wasn't terrifically skilled or anything. They were just being normal people who were doing something that was pretty hard. And I don't remember what I said, but I said this one line that (laughs) also got a a really strong reaction. Uh, I think it had something to, uh, it went something along the lines of, um, I will throw you out the window. I'm going to. And then uh, this one girl just screamed her head off when she heard it. And I was like, oh, okay. This is actually, these people are really cool. And they don't find my dark, horrifying, offensive sense of humor, you know, all that off-putting. So I kept coming back. I hung out with the owner a couple times. He convinced me to take a class. So I go to class. And who's leading it? But old Zachary here. (laughs) So just so everyone in listening knows, uh, Zach was my teacher for for a while. Mm. And uh, we're we're on teams together now, but... He's a f- one of the best improvisers I've ever seen, ever. Yeah. And he's, he's really phenomenal at what he does. Um, <clears throat> so I started taking classes, and they put me in some kind of rhyming improv show as soon as I got there, which was terrifying. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I always had this incredibly rigid, box-like uh, perception of myself, and I couldn't ever deviate from it. And it was really making me suffer in all aspects of my life. And then I started doing improv, and it started to chip off a little bit. 
I found this community of people who applauded me more and more the more I just kind of exposed myself in a PC way. And um, So it's almost like you can't fuck up. Like you can't say the wrong thing and no one's going to be your friend. You know, yeah. everyone's so afraid of doing the wrong thing or saying <laughs> yes. the wrong thing and yeah. you'll lose friends or you'll be ostracized. It sounds like it's, it's the opposite. The truer you were, the weirder yeah. you were in a the good more way. Honest. It's like the more they would embrace you. You take off like the mask. Drug. Yeah. You know, it's, that's uh, what improvisers learn is to take off the mask that we wear all day long. Yeah. It, it, that's the mantra, right? In improv is to say yes and. Uh, that that failure is is a gift and a door to, to uh, mm. more opportunities and, mm. and more comedy. Uh, and we have people come to us all the time from, you know, a business point of view, uh, a, a, like a professional point of view and mm. say, uh, this really helped me find my own voice, uh, like in my professional life as well, you know, because yeah, like exactly like, like what you're saying, people go into business and they're so scared to be themselves, to make a single mistake. Mm -hmm. Oh, my money's on the line. My, my, uh, you know, uh, my character is on the line. And luckily because improv is so absolutely and utterly ridiculous, you know, you're being like a, a mouse with a sword in a church, uh, you can uh, you can kind of let go of that fear a little bit. Learn how to be yourself in a in a safer space where everyone sort of invites you to say yes and mm -hmm. uh, and to laugh at your failures. Then you can take that, pack it up, and go wherever you want to go. Exactly on with your life. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Two great answers. Thank you. Uh, so that I sense two themes within that. <laughs> One is kind of I heard you both say something about self acceptance, mm -hmm. which Truly. leads to self actualization. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a journey of self, and then you both mentioned, I said a line and someone laughed. <laughs> so there's power in being able to affect, affect yes. the world around us, people around us, especially in a positive way. So there's internal and then external. How does that play out through the different realms of comedy theater and so on? Zach, you and I had talked about the dark side of, of stand-up comedy and, and mm -hmm. how I've seen it as it's, it's like their public therapy. You know, there's a lot of stories <laughs> about their parents or damaged relationships and so on, but they make it funny because everyone in the audience is feeling that pain, but they, they flip it. So before I go down that mm -hmm. two themes, have you guys thought about that? Does it, does one drive you over the other? Yeah. Let's it's dig in. for me, it's definitely the internal that drives it a lot more because, uh, externally, you know, sort of, uh, sort of affecting the world. You can do that in a lot of ways. Uh, I I've noticed that there are very few avenues to, uh, self-actualization. You know, it's uh, although it comes in many different flavors and forms, uh, foundationally they they kind of present themselves in the same ways time and time again, and it's it's got to be a, a acceptance and and internal conversation and reflection, right? No matter where that comes from, and with improv, it it really it doesn't even shed light on on the fact that you need to have those internal conversations and reflections. It rips it open entirely yes. uh, because I see, especially cause I've, I've, I've taught improv for so long. It, what I see all the time from, from people who come to level one that have never done improv before uh, they're standing on the sideline waiting for their turn to come in and they're, they're twisted into a knot. They're holding themselves uh, like hugging themselves. Their legs are all twisted up, right? It, like, or people come into scenes. You see that we see this from new improvisers all the time. They hide behind chairs. Uh, when the energy starts to expand, they, they yell the word mom or they, they yell the word help or, or uh, they'll always come into an improv scene and say like, Oh, sorry, this is my very first day working at target. Right. Um, and so sorry is the key word. Right? Yes, yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I, oops, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being myself and I'm doing it the wrong way because I'm in my head and, mm -hmm. and I feel like an idiot. Right. Uh, and it's, it's so funny to see that, uh, because we all do it. I did it too. When I first started performing and, and it's because when you get up, you can be nothing but yourself. Right. Yeah. Like, like Amadeus said, it rips off that mask. Uh, you, you can't, you're not performing, Zach as a business professional. You're not performing Zach at a, at a, like an after theater party where you're hanging out with everybody. You're just on stage and that's it. You know, uh, uh, the, the emperor has no clothes. And, and why is that? Is it fair to say if, if you don't let go, you'll ultimately fail? Yeah. If, if you, if you, if you're thinking about doing improv, you're doing it incorrectly. It, it should well, be so, yeah, acting yeah. and feeling. Yeah. The goal is to kind of enter a trance. And if you're on a team, flow. you, yeah, a flow, a flow state, state, you know, you kind of all reach a mutual frequency that you're all tuned into. And to the audience, it looks like a magic trick. 
because they don't understand what secret sauce was working behind the scenes. Uh, what I've noticed in improv is that it's like a perfect microcosm of life. So, right, anything yes. that helps you get better at improv also coincidentally helps you get better at the larger version of that, which is life. So uh, for most people, uh, it, it's terrifying at first. It's gut-wrenching. But when you get that first laugh, it's a rush, and you get addicted. So you're like, I want to get another one of those. So you keep bashing yourself into the potential that it has. And what you learn at first is <clears throat> you start to notice the same patterns that are holding you back in improv scenes uh, are also the same exact issues that are holding you back in your life. Love right. It. So you might end up uh, discovering that you uh, don't know how to actively listen. Or you might discover that you're shutting yourself down before you begin. And you're saying this isn't going to work. Or you might discover that you are, maybe you get a one word suggestion. For those of you who don't know, we start off with getting a suggestion and then we unpack that into a bunch of inspiration. Um, so you might discover that you come up with this whole idea and you write this script in your head and you're like, well, this is funny. I'll do this. And then you go out and then someone says something on stage that completely destroys all of your hopes of ever doing that. Yeah, you're like, so, oh, we got McDonald's, so I'm going to come out, and I'm going to be at the cash register, and then your friend comes out, and he's like a, a chicken farmer, and you're like, wow, we're not, we're in, not in a restaurant not anymore. <laughs> yeah. And in the audience, you can see when someone forces it. Oh, yeah. Because they're sticking to what was in their head versus mm -hmm. yeah. honoring the scene. And no one likes that. No one wants to see you force it. They want to see you be a human in the moment. More often than not, the audience laughs at... The l biggest laughter has actually come from watching you make a screw up and you smile right through it and you just keep on plugging and yeah. they just clap and applaud. They just saw someone be a real human. It's very rare yes. to do that. So or just to state the honest truth, I get the biggest laughs when I go, well, that didn't work at all. Right. Yes. Uh, it was just like yeah. a tiny bit of meta conversation uh -huh. because uh, again, improv creates an environment in which you can fail freely and be celebrated for it. Right. You, you're, you're not going to fuck up at a business presentation and everybody's going to be like, great job. Oh, you, okay. We we're you failed and we're moving on. Right. Yeah. Like it's, Oh, that was great. So, uh, it's, it's a beautiful opportunity to, 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 yeah. Like Amadeus said to highlight, those walls that you've put up in mm -hmm. your own uh, in your own mind that get in your own way, mm -hmm. and then uh, viciously attack them with with comedy yeah. uh, as openly as you possibly can. And everyone else in in your group in your community is doing the exact same thing. Yes, right. Uh, from the outside looking into a group of improvisers, they might look really wacky, but what they're doing is speaking a language of acceptance and yes, and even more yes. And they're like laughing and having fun. And it, there's a certain element where it appears cult-like, but it's it's just a language like laid into a nested in this frequency of I support the real you rather than, you know, I like the post you made on LinkedIn. Yeah. Is that kind of like yeah. Avatar? Quick reference. Huh. I see you. As in I see you through your avatar. This remember at the end yes. of the movie? Yes. Like mm -hmm. I see you as person not the face the facade the show yeah yeah it's and it's because you you uh you uh, for one to 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 perform at the the top of their game with improv they bear their soul and mm. it's an incredibly vulnerable experience when you do that enough times with a group of people and then especially when you do it with a, a group of people and you and you get failure over and over again, or, or the audience responds with like negativity or sometimes they just get up and leave. You actually right? get negativity. Uh, when you're doing bar prof. Yeah. When I was doing uh, improv oh, in college for four years and we would get up gotcha. and we're doing it in this cold corner of a coffee house. And uh, there are 12 people there and three of them came to see us. And those three also do improv and they're waiting for their turn to get on stage. And the mm -hmm. other ones are there to just like do their book club. And then, uh, you know, every 10 minutes, the barista turns on the blender in the background. Uh, people would ask us like, why the fuck do you keep doing this? It looks like it actually physically hurts you like deep, <laughs> deep inside. And it's, it's because we're bearing our soul and it was for each other. We're doing improv for each other. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And internally to kind of get back to the, the main point, right. Uh, the internal impact that improv has is, uh, if we were going to use another reference from a, di a different show also called Avatar, right? Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, near the end of the final series. Why didn't they make a sequel? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, it's, it was ultimately one of the greatest TV shows. I still rewatch it because it, it teaches me so much 
uh, about, you know, internal qualities that are necessary, right? That, that one of the last episodes where he has to go back to the, or he goes to the guru for the first time and he's teaching him about the chakras and he, he, uh, he's got these little pools that are all stuffed up by the moss and he moves the moss out of the way, right? Uh, improv forces your energy to flow through you in a way that you're not quite aware of, or, or it's like, especially if you, if you don't actively practice Eastern philosophies or, or approach the mm-hmm. world in a meditative way. And that was me, you know, for the first time ever, I started doing improv and I, I would have moments where I'd get off stage and break down because I tackled something so deep mm-hmm. within myself and I didn't realize it. It was incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah. It really opens you up. It really opens you up. That's rad. So that, that brings me to, that's a perfect kind of segue. So it, for anyone who's listening and they're thinking, this sounds amazing. These are coping skills. These are learning skills, growing skills. Not everyone is going to sign up for an improv class. No. Uh, but the way you presented it, I can't get o- around. I can't get around thinking there's really no way to replace being on the stage, being in front of people and truly fucking up. Because the whole point is, I feel like a lot of us, including myself, live in our head mm, and we can yeah. read all the books and know all the things academically. But until you practice that and until you feel that shame that embarrassment that excitement that rush Mm. things are not going to change on that deep level like you just described yeah with all that said people have busy lives i would love for them to feel the benefit of an improv i love it so much not as much as you guys but on the sidelines i love it because it's it's helped me to get out of my head and everything that i've just described Mm -hmm. how can our listener right now kind of practice Kind of even at home or on the job or have, have you thought about yeah, that? I, so I've, I have, I've been thinking about the psychology of improv a lot, uh, sort of also on the side, thinking about just like the, the human consciousness in mind mm. and then the impact, uh, you know, psychedelic experiences have on the mind. And I, I've noticed that holy, holy moly, right. Uh, uh, therein lies the truth, right. As far as the ego is concerned, uh, if, if, if you don't have time to do improv, uh, truly what improv helps you do is kind of like quiet down that voice in the back of your head, which we could call the ego. And, um, so I, I would recommend a, a, you know, if a psychedelic experience, you know, mm-hmm. if, if that's something you're, you're open to, uh, that's something that also, you know, there's, there's something in the, in, in our mind called the, the default mode network in the brain, which is like when you're daydreaming or you, you get in your car after work and then you pull into the, into your driveway at home and you say, I don't really remember the drive. I just kind of did it right. Like Mm -hmm. that's your default mode network, uh, uh, active, right. Uh, think of it like, um, a big, beautiful snowy mountain and you've been riding the same trails and you've just like really used those trails. They're just like embedded in that Mm -hmm. improv. Uh, or, or a psychedelic experience or, or um, approaching some sort of performance or athletic activity in a way that you will reach a flow state. What it does is it sort of shakes the snow globe and it allows snow to fall on those deeply embedded trails uh, so you can form new paths and, and approach difficult conversations internally in a new way. Um, so yeah, I'd say anything that that allows you to you to reach a flow state, uh, a community soccer league, right? That that could teach you. Well, I'm every time I'm I'm like the center midfielder, and every time I get the ball, I try to rush it up the field and score. And it's caused me to realize that I don't share very often. You know, same thing on stage. If I come in and it's my joke and it's my idea every time, well, I don't share very often. You know, it, it leads you to the same place. Um, collaborative activities i think would also get you there yeah it's yeah. it's uh it's possible to do improv and free association uh exercises i yeah. guess but it's not as easy to do and get yourself to do if you don't have a buddy to do it with you know free association because you can bounce off of yourself if you're going to do free association by yourself you're it's you're going to look really crazy (laughs) so let's unpack that real quick for our listener what do you mean by free association okay so uh let's say i was going to let's say i was going to look around the room and start uh talking about the first thing i see right just to kind of uh get your brain into something a more creative mode a flow mode 
you would stop talking about, say you have a whiteboard behind you, right? So I could start talking about the whiteboard, but as soon as I realized that I'm actually talking about the whiteboard, you know, I would have to move over and start talking about something else and then keep zipping around and never allow my brain to focus on it. So I could say, <clears throat> like a whiteboard would inspire me, and uh, I would say, uh, yeah, first day of class, I remember I met my, my great friend, Beasley, and he always shared his, his lunch with me. And then uh, we came back to class, and oh, uh, looking out the window, I, I see the fence. So uh, yes, I was, I was painting a fence this, this one time. And, and uh, is, this, is this making any sense? Because I sound absolutely crazy. Yeah, you're on the right this. track, right? It's, you know, it's I could look around and see these stuffed the animals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You Pulling know? from anything to inspire you and then and then keep it going let's do something that makes more sense right so let's play uh uh, makes me think of third thought yeah right so like give me any word right soda can all right soda can makes me think of diabetes and diabetes makes me think of american heart association great right so then i would take it american heart association makes me think of doing good in the world doing good in the world makes me think of bringing water to third world countries bringing water to third world countries makes me think of Clean water devices. Clean mm. water devices makes me think of engineering. Engineering makes me think of protective masks, and protective masks makes me think of COVID nineteen. Boom. So we we went from uh, what was the first thing you said? Soda can, Soda can. Right? Soda can all the way around to COVID nineteen. Right. We had a yeah. lot of different ideas. So yeah, free association can be incredibly helpful. And again. Uh, I'm sitting there. I'm talking about the whiteboard. Now I'm starting to think about the whiteboard. Right. I'm listening to myself. Uh, it's time to move on. Get that ego. Fuck it. Move the ego out of the way. Yeah. Right? Uh, anything. So that are you can saying you're you overthinking about the whiteboard? Or yes. It yes. Could happen. Yeah. yeah okay. I yeah. started overthinking about the whiteboard. It's kind of the default to overthink things. You know, it's a yeah. practice to undo that. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah, I agree. It, it's uh, it's it's hard to do any improvisational exercise alone. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some you can do. One, one I, I recommend is to look at something. Don't say anything, right? But think it, and then look at something else, and then call that something else the thing you looked at before, right? Mm-hmm. So I would look at you, and I would I would look at my water bottle, and I would say, Stephen, and then I would look at the door, and I would say, water bottle, mm-hmm. right? Look at something else and say, door, and it just it just causes you to look at the world in a different way, it causes you to associate a little bit differently. Um, I read about that. There's a, a John Stone wrote a book, Keith Johnstone. Uh, he said he, he did that exercise for a while, and then what happened is he walked around and he noticed that the colors looked a little bit brighter. He shook up his brain's perception of the world, and like by shaking the dust off of it, he was like more oriented into looking at what things are now that it wasn't so static and everything seemed a little brighter and more colorful, you know? So shaking off that dust is a huge part of the mental dust is a huge part of that disassociation that comes from doing good improv. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, you don't want to do improv. You don't have the time to do improv. There are, there are so many different ways to either collaborate differently and, and initiate flow uh, to, to have uh, a sort of like spiritual experience um, or yeah, t- try some improvisational exercises that that someone can do alone. That'll just wipe that dust off a bit and help you see the world in a, in a more vibrant way. Yeah. I think. Or writing. I mean, you can get into a flow with writing, and as long as you're doing some stream of consciousness and and associating all over the place, I think it's going to be roughly yeah. the same effect. And yeah. We okay. So we've been talking about flow, uh, and very quickly, uh, Jason Silva. Uh, is like a chi- he's just like the champion of flow right now and and he he just to for for those listening right if you're wondering what exactly flow is how can i pinpoint that uh, jason silva says that it's uh the acronym is stir right it's, you reach selflessness timelessness uh effortlessness and and richness uh and if you find yourself in a moment where you and not selflessness like oh i'm not being selfish anymore selflessness like my my idea of the self is starting to change that the ego is going away, right? Uh, timelessness. We've all been there. You're sitting there taking a test in class and 20 minutes feels like one second, right? Or vice versa. You're waiting for class to end and it feels like a lifetime for five minutes to go by. Um, right. That, that's sort of like a bastardized version of flow in a way, uh, especially the timelessness uh, aspect, you know, effortlessness. Uh, it, that's when things start to increase, it becomes easier for, for, for you to, to act, right? Uh, the, the soccer example, uh, if you and your team are like, partway through the, the, the second half and just like really passing a lot better for somebody. Like, how did we just suddenly get better at this game? You didn't, you've entered flow, right? And, and then all that sort of combines for, for a level of richness where your pattern recognition increases, uh, um, 
your capacity to communicate increases, things speed up and become harder and faster. Uh, that's what I mean when I, when I say flow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when you mentioned selflessness, that reminded me of when we were talking about <clears throat> detecting, detecting patterns in, in your improv game that help you with your life. And eventually, once you kind of get out of your own way, right, you begin to look at ways in which you're no longer hindering yourself, but now you just want to be excellent and great at it. And a huge part of that is the selflessness aspect, right? And so you're literally moving from getting out of your own way to now you're building yourself up. And then eventually you start to look at ways in which you can help everyone else out, maybe three other people on stage and they're lost and you can come in and, and help them. You know, Zach's fantastic at that. Uh, that's why everyone feels safe playing with him, right? But you kind of develop this mindset of, I no longer am weighing myself down. I'm free. And what do I do with all of this extra energy that I now have in my day to day? And so it moves more from the world of self therapy into a sort of almost, almost prestigious ability to look around and notice people really read people's faces really hear what they're saying, like with their tone and their body language, because that's key aspects of, of being on stage with people. And it, it's, uh, it's a great journey. You learn a lot of lessons about who you really are. And everyone has a unique idiosyncratic style. So if you can make the time, and I'm sure people can, if they really try, it's worth trying one or two classes out. You might discover something. Mm -hmm. As long as you approach it with an open mind. The last thing you want to do is come in and say, oh, this is so dumb. This is the dumbest thing ever. Look at all these idiots. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> However, a devil's advocate, if that's how they feel, at least they're being true to where they're yes, at at that yeah. point, and maybe you can yeah, I, break through. They'll get that. cracked open if they yeah, come yeah. in with that mindset. Truly. Yeah. I mean, I, we've had people that come and say, this is not for me, but, mm -hmm. and they, they come back later at a different time in their life, and uh, they're utterly transformed by it. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. You should never force yourself to do something if you're uncomfortable with it, but, uh, therein sort of lies that, that moment for growth. I'm a little uncomfortable, but you know, maybe I'll give it a shot anyways and see what happens. What's more uncomfortable sitting home in the same hamster wheel you've been living in or, mm. you know, so until how's the saying go until the discomfort of change is less than the change of being the same. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't say it very well, but I, I, I know something to that. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, Maybe the boredom outweighing the fear of change. Oh, yes, mm. you know. Mm. I like Just, how Gary Vee talks a lot about fear of regret, talking to old people and mm. seeing that the one yeah. thing, the poison in every single old person, regardless of what they did, how they lived their lives, if they didn't do enough, regret is the killer. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid of not doing enough. Yeah, yeah, I see it written all over the the whiteboard. A, a lot of conversations back there. We're uh, here to talk about you guys. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not in oh, vision right. culture. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm just you know I'm an improviser. I'm inspired by what's around. Yeah, me. I can't help but notice it. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, a little surprise for our listener here today. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, Zach and Amadeus have agreed to do a freestyle, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> um, so wait, we did. Oh, <laughs> I didn't sign anything. What, <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? So we're, we're all situated over here, had a couple things to, to work out, but uh, in true improvising form, um, I asked them ahead of time to just kind of take, take some content from our conversation and kind of put it all together. It's up to you guys now. Yeah. About mental health. Uh, Here for half an hour, starting to feel myself. Yes. And if you know somebody that needs some help, help. improv show you how to play with the hands you were dealt. Hey, this right here, this is improv. Improv. Mixed with a little smidge of hip hop. Hip hop. In the podcast room. Through this topic, we're off that soon. Now we are sipping on LaCroix. Me and two other boys met at a great place. We're gonna get to that later. <laughs> we're gonna get to that later right now. We're doing some hip-hop improv. Talk about that mental health. How you go into yourself. 
internal, external, how you're gonna approach the way that you've been feeling. Today, improv maybe will help you start healing. Yeah, you wanna approach the psychology of the mind that you got going on. Is it biology, something else that is above you that is going strong? Is it a god? Maybe it's not. Doesn't really matter what you think. When you get on the stage, rips you open. Tears your soul to the brink. Push your soul to the brink. Push twist out the cost of a shrink. You got some challenges on stage. Don't you shrink? Nope. Nope. You only got a second to decide. So please get out of your own way and ride the wave and the flow. That's how you help yourself. That's how you create some real community wealth. You get together with all of these people. You may not be comfortable cause you vulnerable But you get a feeling that is so lovable And you discover who you are Down at your core, nothing to deplore Just walk through that door and move your feet Move your feet, that's a good point, Amadeus Thank you Wanna move those feet, don't wait Okay, cause the ego's in your mind if the ego's talking, well, jeez, might as well just be a mime, like a puppet, getting controlled by something underneath. You want to approach the way that you're thinking, out loud. If you don't reflect on your mind, gosh, might as well just be a cow out in India. You won't get killed, but you're not doing anything good still. Like, you gotta approach the way that you see the world, and improv lets you do that. It was like that for me and Amadeus, but it, you know, it could just be that sports soccer that I was talking about before. As long as you communicate and collaborate, find some synergy, get into that flow state, get into this. That was awesome. Yeah. Talking about the improv to life microcosm. Yeah. All of these little momentums and habits that you found within yourself, you're not even sure how they happen. Hey, they came from generations of family, and now on stage feeling so dandy it is sweet like candy when you find what's going on deep 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 inside the mental fog mental fog we all have it it's the standard but accepting yourself that's the answer if you can't do that it just might be cancer so cut it out cut it out take that stuff and cut it out <laughs> oh, that fun. was so much fun. Yeah. That was wild. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Uh-huh. Nice little cherry on top of the conversation, I think. Yes. <laughs> and we're, we're not going to muddy the waters. We're going to leave it at that. Anything you want to leave uh, to your listener, whether you're speaking to your past self or someone who's, who's listening right now? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a very good question. At the end of the day, it's, you're going to get out of life what you put into it. Right. And I think if you're willing to jump off the cliff, take a dive, try something new, you'll, you'll really be surprised at the end of the day. You're not going to get anything done if, uh, if you don't approach it and do it. So yeah. jump. So jump. Figuratively. Figuratively. Yeah. 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 Yes. Try, you know, unless your bucket list is like cliff diving or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, skydiving, then uh, uh, do it. Start today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. Well, I mean, that was pretty spot on. So uh, I guess just to change it up a little bit, uh, I would say there is a whole world out there in improv that if you haven't been part of it before, there's a call that you should probably answer. We hope to see you there. There's a huge community of people from all walks of life. There's so many flavors. You're, uh, You're really missing out if you don't at least give it one shot. So if there's anything you can take away from this, just put it on your bucket list. If not today, soon, and come check it out. Love it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you so much. Thanks, yeah, Steven. Thank you. It was a great time here. Yeah. Awesome. Anytime. Ooh. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this episode. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorites. That was a lot of fun, and I'm really glad they took the time to be here. Now, if any of the topics or ideas intrigued you, I absolutely encourage you to reach out to your local improv theater. The one that we go to and they perform at down here in St. Pete, Florida is Spitfire Theater. They have a new location on First Avenue South. They do an amazing job, and I hope you give it a shot. 
Otherwise, talk to you real soon. Take care. <laughs>